There is nothing more tantalizing to the human species than a good mystery. Thrillers in the forms of novels, movies, and even campfire tales are often consumed by the thousands who love the adrenaline rush of solving a mystery. However, some of the most pervasive mysteries are those that occur in real life, and these are the ones that are often most difficult to solve. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at mysterious discoveries. Giant Monoliths at Baalbek In the modern city of Baalbek, Lebanon, are several massive monoliths known to be the largest in the world. Baalbek was under Roman rule for a period of time, in which it was referred to as Helipolis, or City of the Sun. The stones were cut and carved to be used for one of the grandest and largest temples to the Roman god Jupiter, known by the Greeks as Zeus. The temple features one of the most awe-inspiring megalithic foundations, consisting of 27 enormous limestone blocks. Three of the largest make up the base, and are known as the Trilithon, with each weighing at least 1,000 tons. Aside from those three are two other monoliths, larger and heavier than the ones actually used for the temple. One of those was the Stone of the Pregnant Woman. The other is known as the Stone of the South and is even heavier. The Stone of the Pregnant Woman was first thought to be the largest monolith discovered. Analyses of the size and weight of the enormous monolith in Baalbek, Lebanon by the German Archaeological Institute revealed that the megalithic block was one of the largest ever discovered. Its name comes from stories and legends that a pregnant woman tricked villagers into believing that she would be able to move it if they fed her until she gave birth. Other stories say that the name comes from legends that pregnant jinn were assigned the task of cutting and moving the stones. There are even some who believe that a woman who touches the stone raises her chances at fertility. The blocks originated from a limestone quarry nearby. The monoliths are thought to date back at least 2,000 years, or to around 27 BC. Although they were probably intended to be used for a temple to Jupiter, these stones never made it to the building, laying at a distance of 900 meters away from the Heliopolis temple complex. Experts believe this is because they turned out to be too heavy to transport. Researchers also discovered later that a crack in the stone of the pregnant woman must have been the reason why it, specifically, was never transported. The stone of the south was discovered after the stone of the pregnant woman as it rests underneath the latter and was mostly buried under a few feet of dirt. The stone of the south is now the largest known ever carved by human hands, at 1,242 tons. These monoliths are thought to have probably been cut in the same way as the masonry used in the Pont de Garde, a Roman aqueduct in southern France. Each piece would have been split from a larger expanse of limestone along natural fissures. Because they would have been too heavy to lift, they were likely pulled using a capsan, like a human-driven winch, or using a sledge. Despite these stones being a possible disappointment to their carvers, as they turned out to be useless for the purposes of the temple, the Stone of the Pregnant Woman and the Stone of the South both set a world record for the biggest boulders ever discovered. Scientists claim to have found the first known extraterrestrial protein in a meteorite. This year, researchers were happy to discover that we may have uncovered a vital clue that points towards life elsewhere in our solar system. By using new techniques in analysis and research, scientists believe that they could have found a type of extraterrestrial protein that was hidden in the middle of a meteorite that fell to Earth only 30 years ago. If the findings are accurate, then this would mean that it is the first ever protein that did not come from Earth to ever be discovered. Over the last number of years, researchers have come across a number of meteorites and other bits of space debris that have shown to hold elements and materials that belong to what we consider to be the fundamental building blocks of life. These materials include ribose, amino acids, as well as cyanide, and this specific discovery showed signs that the meteor held amino acids. The research team was led by the physicist Malcolm McGeoch. 
who works for the X-ray source supplier Plex Corporation, and they aimed their search in discovering vital life-building materials in meteorites. By using complex, modern examination techniques, the team discovered what they believed to be a protein string in the meteorite known as ACFA-086. The apparent discovery of protein within the meteor that was originally found in 1990, it is just one more part of the growing tapestry of evidence of life outside of our own planet. An astronomer and chemist of CSIRO Astronomy and Space Science in Australia who didn't work on the project said, in general, they're taking a meteor that has been preserved by a museum and has been analysed previously, and they are modifying the techniques that they're using in order to be able to detect amino acid inside of this meteor, but in a higher signal ratio. To summarise the team's findings, the research results showed that the glycine amino acid found in the meteorite was bound to other elements like iron and lithium. What they ultimately found was that glycine wasn't isolated from the protein, but was part of it. This new type of protein was dubbed protein hemolithin. While protein hemolithin is similar to proteins found on Earth, it's not exactly similar to anything found terrestrially here on Earth. All of this news and research helps to suggest that the structure the team found is actually a protein with an origin outside of Earth, possibly formed in the protosolar disk over 4.6 billion years ago. Who is Harry's father? Princess Diana admitted that she had an affair with Major James Hewitt that lasted from 1986 to 1991. This affair occurred at the same time as Prince Charles was cheating on Diana with Camilla Parker Bowles, his current wife. Diana and James met at a courtier's cocktail party. She asked him to give her horseback riding lessons, and their relationship quickly progressed from there. Apparently, it was Diana who initiated the affair one day, telling him that he gave her strength and she hated not being with him. James often snuck into Kensington Palace since Diana and Charles had separate bedrooms. He soon became a regular guest whenever Charles left on trips. Even Diana's sons, William and Harry, grew very fond of James because he was there so often. Ken Wharf, Diana's former protection officer, wrote a book called Diana, Closely Guarded Secret. In the book, Ken called James a womanizer who gave Diana the attention and affection she so badly desired. He said that Diana would sometimes meet James at a cottage that belonged to James's mother, and Ken could hear them together. James says that the two would simply have dinner and relax together, just enjoying each other's presence. Their relationship slowed down in 1989 when James was sent to Germany, even though Diana attempted to pull strings so he would not have to go. They rekindled their romance in 1990 before he was deployed to serve in the Gulf War. Diana could tell James was serious about their relationship from the way he spoke in his letters. She began to pull away from him and they finally split up for good in 1991. It has been said that James Hewitt might be Prince Harry's father ever since their affair became public, though James has denied this accusation. He believed that people were only spreading rumours because it would sell papers. Ken has also said in his book that this accusation is nonsense because the timeline does not add up. Diana and James did not meet until two years after Harry was born. People often like to point out that Harry has red hair like James, but Ken is quick to remind people in his book that Harry's red hair comes from Diana's side of the family. Jose Bonilla Observation on the 12th and 13th of August, 1883, an astronomer at a small observatory in Mexico made an extraordinary observation. While observing sunspot activity, Jose Bonilla saw around a legion of objects, each surrounded by a vapour passing across the face of the sun. He was able to take a few photographs, exposing the photographic plates at around one hundredth of a second, a particularly fast shutter speed for something so far away. These would come to be the earliest photos of an unidentified flying object. There were many suggestions on what these flying objects could be. Bonilla himself never actually put forward his own explanation, and a few years later the journal in which Bonilla's photos were published, something far more straightforward was suggested. This included things like migrating animals, or even insects. Others have gone on to suggest that the objects were extraterrestrial in nature, 
and in their shapes, flight approach and numbers could well have been an army of alien craft. What scientists eventually came to surmise, however, was something far more terrifying, an extinction event in totality for all life on this planet. Scientists estimate that the objects ranged in size from 50 to 800 meters and were breakaways from a large parent meteor. That parent comet was around the same size as Halley's Comet, weighing well over a billion tons. Not only that, but the objects were around 600 kilometers to 8,000 kilometers away from colliding with Earth. In astronomical terms, this is equivalent to a bullet grazing your head so close it shaves off some of your hair. So, if a collision had occurred, what would have been the result for us? Bonilla observed these objects for about three and a half hours over two days. There was an average of 131 objects per hour, and a total of 3,275 objects in the time between observations. So, if they had collided with Earth, we would have had 3,275 Tunguska events in two days. The Tunguska event refers to a huge explosion caused by a meteoroid impact in northern Russia. It flattened an estimated 80 million trees over 830 square miles, with its power around three times that of the Hiroshima nuclear bomb. Clearly, one of those impact events is bad enough, but over 3,000 all within a couple of days, that is one visit from outer space that planet Earth is happy to have missed. Ulfbert Viking Sword A series of swords have sparked conversation amongst various scientists, historians, skeptics, and believers alike for years. The Ulfbert Viking Swords have been traced back to the Vikings, but appear to have been made through modern techniques, making them thousands of years ahead of their time. Many say they are the swords made from technology of the future, as even today we are unsure how these steel swords were made by such ill-equipped societies. These swords were used in battle from 800 AD to 1100 AD. Despite this long period, they were a scarce sight, with very few warriors being believed to have used these swords. After 1100 AD, the Ulfbert are believed to have been largely untouched until they were uncovered in Europe an estimated 1,000 years after their initial creation. The Ulfbert swords have been dubbed such due to the inscription alongside the blade, though no one knows why this sword, term, or even possible acronym has been engraved on the sword. In medieval written texts, there is no evidence of Ulfbert being used, adding to the speculation. Some believe it is a name of a place, a potential city of origin, and some think it was simply a mark of authenticity and quality in older historical periods. The aim of an ironsmith was to produce a steel that would not bend or break, a steel that could be sharp but not delicate. This was evidently achieved in the making of the Ulfbert swords. More recently, scholars have researched the etymological roots of Ulfbert, concluding that it is a Frankish name. Furthermore, the cross on the sword connotes a religious connection, more specifically to the Roman Catholic Church. This research is highly complementary, as the Church oversaw the Frankish Empire in the Middle Ages, so a strong connection being made between the Frankish roots of Ulfbert and the Roman Catholic cross is logical. Another key aspect to these swords you don't want to miss is the Greek cross appearing before the name. Typically, a placement of a cross before a name was reserved to indicate a bishop or abbot. This has led many researchers to suggest that Ulfbert is the name of either a bishop or abbot, and others have put forward the idea that Ulfbert could be the name of a monastery. So far, 44 Ulfbert swords have been examined and determined to be 100% steel, and only 170 swords have been proven to be Ulfbert at all. As with any object of such high status, copycats have occurred. Objects that bear a strikingly similar resemblance to these marvellous swords have ultimately been branded mimics. So where does the magic happen? The bizarre aspect to these battle swords is that they excel what we know to be possible for the time period in which they were created. How did Vikings create swords that were clearly so strong without the facilities to do so? The vast majority of swords we associate with the Viking period were characteristically low in carbon and full of impurities, aspects of the ore that weaken the metal. 
Throughout the medieval period, it was not physically possible to remove ore from the steel. The equipment we use today simply wasn't available. The process involved heating a metal to north of 3000 degrees in order to add carbon and remove impurities, though fires alone simply are not hot enough to do this. It is believed that the Vikings would attempt to hammer out impurities, though this simply wasn't effective. Yet the Ulfbert steel is more similar to modern-day steel objects than those of the medieval period. When compared against 21st century steel and other medieval steel, the Ulfbert swords showed a far purer product, with the carbon content reaching three times higher than anticipated. This indicates that Ulfbert is, at a minimum, 1,000 years more advanced than it should be. Whether you wholeheartedly believe in magic or simply find these historical pieces curious, the strange backstories certainly do invite plenty of questions. The Girls of La Salette La Salette, France, is a small town at the foothills of the Alps. Today it is small, but in 1846 it was a bustling hamlet with nearly 800 residents, mostly farmers, and their families. Farmers were enjoying an economic boom, due in no small part to the French Revolution of 1789. Napoleon's regime stabilised economic tensions, and the introduction of new crops such as the potato and the beetroot helped improve food security and prices. In addition to these new crops, many of the families in La Salette tended to livestock such as sheep and cows. The livestock would be released into the beautiful lush pastures on the slopes of the Alps, and local children were dispatched to complete the fairly easy task of minding the herd. On September 19th, Melanie Calvat, 15, and Maximin Giroux, 11, were enjoying the sunlight of a warm fall day. The weather had not yet turned cool, and the herd of cows they were minding was grazing on the slopes about three miles from the nearby village. Suddenly, they noticed a woman clad in strange, vibrant clothing. She was sitting on the mountainside, weeping. The woman wore a headdress topped by a crown and a band of roses, a dress that shone with beams of light and slippers with roses on them. She appeared bathed in a pool of light so bright it seemed to be fiery. Around her neck she wore a golden crucifix, with a hammer and nails on one end and a pincher on the other. She continues to weep, but she called the children closer to her. Neither of them were pious, but they somehow knew this was the Virgin Mary herself. They approached as in a trance. Mary told the children that today's Catholics had strayed too far from the faith. She instructed them to respect the seventh day, which was to be set aside to rest and to respect the name of God. If her words were not obeyed, she said, the town of La Salette would be punished by famine, in particular a scarcity of potatoes. Of course, a French countryside gripped by the potato famine in 1845 could not handle more loss. Mary's message was timely. Melanie and Maximin dutifully took the message they received back to the townspeople, where they were quizzed individually. The stories matched, and the town's most prominent religious figures brought the apparition to the attention of the local priest. Despite threats of imprisonment from the French government, the children maintained their story. The site of the apparition was carefully investigated, and several miracles were documented. Someone broke off a rock in the place where Mary had been seated and water flowed out. The water was used to cure a local woman's illness. Attendance at mass skyrocketed, and by 1851, a new religious order and church was founded in the little town at the base of the mountain, the Missionaries of La Salette. Today, pilgrims travel from all over the world to visit the site of the La Salette apparition. The members of the order strive to spread Mary's message across the globe. Interestingly, all throughout history, there appears to be a number of strange and unexplainable phenomenon centred around religious gatherings and events that many find impossible to explain in the modern day. Additionally, many of these strange and mysterious religious events seem to point to the idea that perhaps our world is far stranger than we ever realised before. We may never truly understand what brings believers to such unbelievable sights. As of today, there's still whispers of these apparitions appearing to people. Whether they are genuine is up for debate, but eyewitnesses have said that they know what they saw and that whatever it was didn't come from this earth. The UK's Bigfoot 
Bigfoot is a mythical ape-like creature who walks on two feet, much like a man, and supposedly inhabits the Pacific Northwest of America. Yet, in recent times, Bigfoot sightings seem to have migrated from the states across to the UK. Bigfoot has reportedly been spotted in a few different locations across England and also in Northern Ireland. In fact, Bigfoot enthusiast Adam Bird, aged 31, was recently investigating a supposed Bigfoot hotspot in a Lincolnshire nature reserve with his team at the British Bigfoot Research Organisation. The group, who seek evidence to prove the existence of Bigfoot, felt they were being followed the entire time they were on the reserve, and said that it was as if somebody was watching them. Adam took multiple photos that day but had not noticed anything odd whilst taking them. It was only when he flicked back through them that he noticed a strange figure lurking in the woodland overgrowth. He described it was a dark silhouette figure similar to a man stood within the trees, facing myself and my team. I make no claims of this mysterious figure, but my fellow investigators think this could be genuine evidence that the British Bigfoot organisation has waited for. Another British Bigfoot researcher, named Deborah Hatswell, is also convinced of Bigfoot's existence. She created a map that pinpointed all the sightings of Bigfoot in the UK. Bigfoot appearances have been spotted everywhere. Practically every country in Britain has seen some form of Bigfoot-like creature. Everywhere in the world has its own stories, and the UK is no different. Bigfoot, the black-eyed children, and the black cats of the UK have inspired generations of storytelling, myths, and legends amongst Britons. Whether these creatures or beings are real or not, they definitely make for sufficient stories to be told for many years to come. Bangar Fort, Rajasthan Built in the 17th century in Rajasthan state of India, the Bangar Fort is known as one of India's most haunted locations. Past the ramparts, into the ruins, you will find a dramatic main gate leading to multiple ancient temples, including the Hanuman Temple and Gopinath Temple, as well as numerous palaces. The other entrances into Bangar are the Delhi Gate, Ajmeri Gate, Pulbari Gate and Lahori Gate. It was built by Bhagwant Das, the Kashwaha ruler of Amba, for his son Mado Singh. The town was ultimately deserted, however, during a 1783 famine and fell to ruins. Today the fort is known for being a breeding ground of paranormal activity. There are two main legends that encompass the supernatural tendencies of the area. The first involves the Sadhu Baba Balak Nath. Sadhu refers to a holy person who has renounced worldly life. According to this legend, Baba Balaknath lived in the fort and demanded that all houses built must not be constructed taller than his. He proclaimed that if the shadow of any other house fell onto his, he would ensure the destruction of the entire town. Allegedly, the rule was not followed, resulting in the town's demise and a permanent sinister energy. In another version of this tale, the sadhu is referred to as Balunath. Instead of living in a house, Balunath lived in a nearby cave. Mado Singh needed Balunath's permission to construct a fortress because of his claim to the land as his site of meditation. He complied but ordered Mado Singh to ensure that the shadows of the fortress did not touch his cave or disturb his meditation. But after the sun shifted south in the winter, the shadows grew longer and this spoken contract was breached. This woke Balunath up from his deep meditation, and he soon issued a curse on the town. The curse prevented roofs from ever being constructed in the fort. Today, none of the old houses have a roof remaining. It is said that any new construction in Bangar Fort leads to a collapsed roof. According to the second legend, Singai, a wizard well-versed in the practice of black magic, fell in love with a Bangar princess named Ratnavati, who was said to have unparalleled beauty. Singai offered the princess a love potion in the marketplace but was refused. She threw the potion onto a large rock, which then rolled onto the wizard, crushing him, causing him to pass away. In another version, Singai cast a spell on a bottle of perfume Ratnavati's maid was buying in the village. If Ratnavati used the scent, she would fall in love with him. When the princess learned about the spell, 
she threw it out the window, and the potion struck either Singhai or, in the other stories, a boulder that then rolled onto the wizard. Before he passed away, he cursed the inhabitants of the fort. Next year, the curse took hold for the princess and the townspeople when the Magals invaded and took the life of them. Due to the town's disturbing alleged past, the insidious atmosphere remains to this day. The fear of the fort is so prevalent that the Archaeological Survey of India has prohibited anyone from entering or remaining in the fort past sundown. Currently, people unknown to the area are banned from entry without special permission because they are so prone to getting mysteriously lost. Creepy warnings are posted all over the town to discourage entry at night. One sign reads, It is forbidden to enter the borders of the haunted Bangar fort before sunrise and after sunset. It is believed that the soul of Singai still searches for his princess in the night. Another creepy phenomenon is that, due to the curse placed on the roofs in the fort, new constructions have allegedly led to numerous fatal collapses. Visitors have also seen unexplained shadows, strange lights, and the apparition of a little boy looking out the window in one of the houses. Many disturbing sounds can be heard through the area, such as the sounds of screams, bangles, women crying, and music accompanied by the voices of people dancing to it. Locals also say that if you stay overnight at the fort, you will never return. If you choose to visit this area, who knows what you might experience. There seems to be a great variety of mystical happenings to choose from. Bridgewater Triangle the next mysterious area is also found in the United States, more specifically in the state of Massachusetts. Just 30 miles outside of Boston, you'll find the Bridgewater Triangle, which encompasses six towns, Raynham, Taunton, Brockton Mansfield, Norton, and Easton. A paranormal researcher by the name of Lauren Coleman gave Bridgewater Triangle its name in 1970 after a vast number of paranormal activities were reported in the area. The Hokomok Swamp is one of many mysterious landmarks in the area. An 8,000-year-old Native American burial ground was found at this site and archaeologists couldn't believe what happened when they opened the graves. It is said that the tombs bubbled before vanishing. The swamp is still known as a superstitious site where spirits dwell. Within the Hokomok Swamp is Dighton Rock, which is known for unusual carvings on the face of the rock. There have been many speculations as to how the carvings got there, but nothing has been confirmed. The Anawan Rock is also located within the swamp, and it's said that the angry spirits of Chief Anawan's warriors haunt the surrounding area. Profile Rock is yet another landmark with a paranormal reputation. With carvings of a North American face on the rock, the natives believe it to be sacred and legend says that Native American ghosts dance around the rock. If the mysterious rock carvings are not enough, there have been various UFO sightings within the Bridgewater Triangle. The first report was in 1760, which would most likely make it the first documented sighting on the planet. There were many more sightings in the 1900s, adding to Bridgewater Triangle's mysteries. Mysterious creatures have also been said to wander through the Bridgewater Triangle. Reports of Bigfoot-like creatures surfaced in the 1970s and when further investigated, experts were unable to come to a conclusion. Other creatures have been seen in the area with no explanation. With just about every ounce of unusual activity within the Bridgewater Triangle, it wouldn't be complete without a few ghost stories. Ghostly phantoms have been spotted many times, making the triangle even more spooky. It can be challenging to imagine that so many paranormal acts have taken place or been recorded in one area. Do you believe the ghost stories, or do you think that some stories have been embellished over time for dramatic purposes? The University of St Andrews, Scotland the University of St Andrews, Scotland is so well known for being haunted that it is the centre of numerous ghost tours. St Andrews is the oldest university in Scotland and the third oldest in the English-speaking world. Teaching began in 1410 and the university was formally constituted in 1413, plenty of time to acquire some ghosts. 
the historic town of St Andrews is known as one of the most haunted places in Scotland, with reports of ghosts ranging from monks, mysterious women, and even a ghost ship. There are a total of 200 haunted locations and 400 spectres believed to haunt St Andrews. The White Lady is one of St Andrews' most famous ghosts and is believed to be one of the ladies-in-waiting of Mary, Queen of Scots, or a former nun who now roams the abbey ruins or the cathedral, which is very close to the university. The university has its own ghost, believed to be Patrick Hamilton, a 16th century student and teacher, the first martyr of the Scottish Reformation. The spot where he passed away is believed to be cursed and you will notice students dodging his initials in the cobbles on the street beneath the bell tower of St. Salvador's Chapel, one of the oldest buildings at St. Andrew's University. Patrick Hamilton was executed in 1528 at the age of 24. He was tried as a heretic and his life was taken at the stake for his Protestant beliefs. The ending of his life was not quick and reportedly lasted for over six hours, with executioners struggling to light the fires with damp wood failing to ignite and a slow burning fire. There are a few local traditions and myths added to Patrick Hamilton's loss of life. The university notes that the mysterious face carved into the stonework of the college tower above the gateway is that of Patrick Hamilton. It is believed that as he passed away, his face was burned into St. Salvador's Tower. Students also refused to step on the initials PH in the spot where he was executed as rumours state that Patrick Hamilton will curse them to fail their exams. Some students have experienced strange things at the execution site, such as the sound of cracking and the smell of burning flesh. The monk that verbally condemned Patrick Hamilton as he was slowly burned, Alexander Campbell, is said to have passed away shortly after and that he is the lone figure that roams Blackfriars Chapel in the centre of St Andrews. The Mysterious Sky Disc The Nebra Sky Disc was originally discovered by two men back in 1999 that were treasure hunting with a metal detector without a licence in the state of Saxony-Anhalt. This led to the treasure hunters unearthing the disc, two bronze swords, two hatchets, a small chisel and a number of fragments of spiral bracelets throughout the region. Well aware of their finds without that of a treasure hunting license, the two men quickly decided to sell the artifacts to the black market in order to cover up their looting and make money in the process. This decision led to them selling the entire find for 31,000 Deutschmarks to a private collector in Cologne. The find would then go on to exchange hands within the black market community for several years, leading to the value of the piece being sold at more than a million Deutschmarks throughout Germany. It was not until 2001 that the discovery would find itself within the public eye, leading to a police operation to recover the looted collection and trace the sale all the way back to the original finders back in February of 2002. This led to the two men working out a plea deal with the government by showing them the original excavation site, which led to them only receiving roughly four to ten months in prison. Unfortunately, the two men would later try to appeal, leading to them receiving six to twelve months of prison time. The Nebra Sky Disc is described as being a small disc a mere twelve inches in diameter and weighing close to five pounds in total. The dating of the disc was found to be from the middle of the 2nd millennium BC, making the artifact roughly 4,000 years old. The disc itself seems to be a strange find as it features images of a full moon, a waxing moon, the Pleiades constellation, and additional zones on the sides to mark the rising and setting of the sun with the depiction of a boat moving across the night sky. This has led to some researchers believing that the disc could be evidence of an astronomical instrument, whereas others argue that it may have some religious significance. Additionally, ancient alien theorists have speculated that it could be evidence of an ancient UFO sighting of a shape moving across the night sky that was recorded in ancient times. The Black-Eyed Children of Cannock Chase The Black-Eyed Children are contemporary legends, first referenced in American folklore. If you've never heard of them, you would probably be wondering what and who they are. However, 
this eerie entity seems to be anything but human. Some think that black-eyed children are creatures of the supernatural, and it's reported that they are often found hitchhiking or in strange places alone. In 2014, residents of a small area of green countryside and quaint villages in Staffordshire, England, allegedly had an experience with these strange beings. Lee Brickley, a paranormal investigator from the local area, received a letter from a resident of the area who believed she'd seen a black-eyed girl in Cannock Chase. The investigator took one look at the description and immediately realised that this specific sighting had occurred before in the area. However, this was 30 years earlier. Lee released a description which his own aunt provided of the girl she'd seen in the 1980s, and locals immediately drew comparisons between the two figures. He described his aunt's encounter. My aunt was only 18 years old at the time. In the summer of 1982, herself and a friend would frequently meet on Cannock Chase in the evenings. An evening, just before the darkness approached, we heard a small child hysterically yelling. We couldn't work out whether she was in danger or not. Nevertheless, rushing to find the yells, we stumbled upon a footpath and caught sight of a girl, about six years old, sprinting in the opposite direction. When they caught up, the girl turned around and stared into my aunt's eyes, then proceeded to run off into the pitch-dark woodland. She described her eyes as being entirely black, with no trace of white. A police search was conducted, but was unsuccessful. At the time, no one had any reason to believe anything paranormal was going on. The girl certainly appeared to be of flesh and blood. The latest description of the black-eyed girl of Cannock Chase was provided by a woman under the name of Mrs. Kelly. My daughter and I were walking through the Birches Valley, an area well known for its impressive sightings. However, we stopped in our tracks when we heard the screams of a young girl. Unsure if the noise was a boy or a girl, they undoubtedly gave the impression they were in a state of turmoil. However, they sounded close, therefore we immediately started to run towards the noise. Unsure of the whereabouts of the child, we stopped to catch our breath and tried to relocate where the noise was. That's when I turned around and saw a girl stood behind me. No older than ten years old, she had her hands over her eyes, like she was scared or hiding something. I asked if she had been the one shouting. She then put her arms by her sides and opened her eyes. That's when I saw they were completely black. It was like looking into the state of nothingness. I jumped back and grabbed my daughter. I blinked and the child was gone. It was strange and bizarre. Lee Brickley, the investigator, believes that black-eyed children, like those found in Cannock Chase, are actually demonic beings and exist for evil purposes. He also recognizes that, of many of the sightings of black-eyed children, it seems as if the creatures are leading others towards some sort of danger. One thing has been recognized. The Cannock Chase sightings are the only sightings that occur during the daytime. Whether these sightings are false or actually credible, we do not know. However, you definitely wouldn't want to stumble across a black-eyed child at any time of day. Lambertville High School our next mysterious and haunted school is Lambertville High School in New Jersey. The school was first constructed in 1854, and the original structure had mostly burned in a fire in the early 1920s. There were many rumors spread about the fire, claiming the lives of 50 students and some teachers. However, it was rebuilt and remodeled and was still in use as a school. Another rumour about a player named Billy from the Buckeyes football team circulated after they came to play Lambertville High. After Billy was piled and jumped on by the Lambertville players, they discovered he had actually passed away. Some said they saw his broken neck and head turned completely around on his corpse. From that day on, Billy was believed to have haunted the halls of the school, even after it was closed and abandoned. The haunted story claims that if you visit the school at night and say, Billy, I challenge you to a football game, your neck would be snapped and you'll pass away instantly. Of course, this has never been recorded to have actually happened, but it still remains an ominous tale today. In 1992, another fire was set in the school by vandals and after that, it was abandoned. Eventually, the school was demolished in 2012 
And although the school no longer stands, the ghost stories still remain alive. Gettysburg College Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where around 50,000 casualties occurred in a three-day battle in 1863 in the American Civil War, is home to numerous ghost stories, with multiple tours taking place around the town. It is no surprise that the university here also has a reputation for being haunted. Gettysburg College was established in 1832 as Pennsylvania College, and during the battle, the Pennsylvania Hall of the College became a hospital for soldiers from both the North and South. The college has since been the site of numerous Civil War ghost experiences. A scene that has been reportedly witnessed by many across the years is a fully working Civil War hospital in the basement of Pennsylvania Hall. In most cases, witnesses were taking the elevator down to the basement, and when it opened, they saw the gruesome scene of wounded soldiers being worked on by doctors and nurses, with the whole scene happening silently. When returning to check on the basement, it had returned to normal, and no sign of the Civil War operating theatre remained. The cries and moans of young men can also be heard at Penn Hall, believed to belong to soldiers that lost their lives here. This is just one of many ghost stories that are reported across the campus. Penn Hall is also home to the Lone Sentinel, or the Lookout, a lone guard that carries a rifle and lantern. It is said that he is seen around as if he was still patrolling the cupolas on campus, watching the northwest area of the battlefield. Stevens Hall is another famous ghost story from the college. Built in 1911, there have been multiple sightings of a blue boy. The rumours are that during an icy winter's night, a boy that was fleeing abuse at a local orphanage was given shelter by girls living in the dorm, which at that time was Pennsylvania College Prep School. The house mother knocked on the door and the girls hid the boy outside on the window ledge. Once the house mother had left, the girls looked for the boy, but there was no sign of him apart from footprints in the snow. A boy with a blue face, as if he had frozen, is believed to haunt Stevens Hall. He is often seen peering inside with his face pressed against the window. Sometimes the words, help me, are seen written on frosted panes of glass. Glatfelter Hall at Gettysburg College is home to the Lady in White. One legend surrounding this apparition goes back to a couple which made a pact to take their own life in which the male backed out and the girl jumped, and she now tries to lure others to jump. Another story behind the Lady in White is that she lost her love as a result of the war and took her own life by jumping from Glatfelter's bell tower. In this version, anyone who looks into her eyes will meet the same fate. These are just the most famous ghost stories from Gettysburg College, and there are likely many more that have not been told as widely. Pennsylvania State University Our last haunted school is Pennsylvania State University, otherwise known as Penn State or PSU. The university was founded in 1855 as an agricultural college but eventually introduced other programs such as engineering. When the engineering program took off, more degrees were introduced and enrollment figures were doubling each year. So what's so scary about Penn State? For starters, the hauntings began when a student lost their life in 1969 at the library. She was working on a paper and was brutally punctured by a knife from behind. A librarian was made aware of the slaughter when a mysterious man mentioned a woman on the floor not moving. She was found on the floor of row 51. The person who conflicted this brutal stabbing was never caught, and the case has remained open. Ever since the rows have changed throughout the library, but many have heard screams, gasps, and seen bloodstains. However, there doesn't seem to be an explanation for these sounds or the blood. Besides the library, Penn State is also said to be home to another ghost. Atherton Hall is one of the oldest buildings on campus, and students believe that Frances Atherton, the late wife of the school's former president, is haunting the building. Students have claimed to see doors open and close without a person there to do it, as well as seeing her ghost 
looking out of the window from the top floor. There have been many other supposed ghosts found on campus. In fact, students have also heard the footsteps of a house mother who patrolled the floors at night after curfew to make sure no one was coming in late. Current students who live in the building have said they hear footsteps randomly late at night. Unfortunately, the haunting doesn't stop there. Schwab Auditorium is another hotspot for paranormal activity. The theatre is also believed to be home to the ghost of a former janitor. Unusual activity such as hearing heavy footsteps, doors creaking open and finding objects mysteriously relocated is enough to convince many students of the ghost's existence. With so many haunting stories and experiences taking place at Penn State, a former student formed a paranormal research society in 2006. The purpose of the club was to investigate paranormal cases to try and make sense of them. The group became popular within the school and eventually caught the media's attention, and they had their own reality series on television. Eventually, the club was handed off to younger students who continued to study the unusual events that take place at the university and surrounding areas. At this point, nothing groundbreaking has been discovered, but with many eyes watching and learning about paranormal activity, they just might arrive at some answers one day. Have you seen a ghost or had similar experiences? Are there any haunted places where you're from? For those who believe in ghosts and have seen them for themselves, these places are unbelievably frightening. There are also many non-believers who visit and have a scary interaction with the supernatural forces. Although we can't exactly prove their existence yet, there's no telling what we'll discover in the future. We might just have to wait for ghosts to appear before our eyes in order to fully believe. But what do you make of these mysteries and disappearances? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.